Last week we spent most of our time, as we're starting out in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, just showing the, the process that the Old Testament worshiper went through uh, and how that everything relating to the tabernacle was pointing to Jesus. And of course this is all in the context of writing the Hebrews. Some people were wanting to get back to uh, are being in, in, in encouraged to go back to Judaism. And there's several problems with that. But behind all of this, we can say, as for our own era, our own time, we might ask the question, what has happened to guilt? And do we understand guilt correctly? Uh, there are many who are guilty. Uh, they've never dealt with their sin, but they feel really good about themselves. Uh, others are like a, a psychiatrist was talking to his patient, and it's a pretty good psychiatrist. <laughs> Mr. Figby, I think I can explain your feelings of guilt. You're guilty. <laughs> Well, the Bible declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin alienates us. It separates us from God. Brings us under the decree of, his, of the penalty of sin, which is ultimately punishment in the lake of fire. If he only meets out justice, then that's what happens to everybody. But thankfully, the Bible declares and sets forth that God has provided a way to deal with guilt. And so when you look at the whole of the Bible, the, we could say that there are two main themes. There's a the problem of sin, and that's set forth all throughout the Bible, and then there is the provision of mercy and grace through a substitutionary lamb who ultimately is set forth as Jesus Christ. Now again, the Hebrew Christians were being tempted to leave the Christian faith, return to Judaism. There's a couple of problems with that. Uh, number one, the days of the Old Covenant were done, completed. Uh, it was a good system, and not a perfect system, but it was a good system for its time period. But now all that it looked forward to was completed and fulfilled in Jesus. And the other problem in that particular day was that the that what was practiced in Judaism during the New Testament era was a prostitution of Judaism as was in the Old Covenant. But the Old Covenant, the, uh, what is set forth in actually literally going through uh, the steps here in the tabernacle or the temple, um, inferior. So, um, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, we have these words. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly or earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. And so, by the way, have you thought about this? Approximately how many chapters are given in the Bible to the historical account of creation? Two. two chapters. Basically two chapters. Now there's some things mentioned in the New Testament, but there's specifically Genesis 1 and 2, and we go on. How many chapters are given 
to the tabernacle in the Bible? Around 50. 50. Now, the creation is important, but redemption is far more important. The problem of sin is a problem. And so uh, the tabernacle was the center of worship in the Old Covenant, and everything there was pointing to Christ. And as we read, it was divided into two sections, the holy place and the holy of holies. And in the holy place, the priests entered, there was a golden lampstand, and it provided the only light. To the right was a table that held sacred bread, and further into the center outside the veil that divided the holy place from the holy of holies was an altar of incense. Inside the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant which contained a jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. Covering the ark was something called the mercy seat. In Greek, the place of propitiation. And indeed, that's what it was, a place whereby sin could be <coughs> propitiated. God's wrath satisfied. So the lampstand, everything there is pictures of Christ. Uh, he illuminates all things. The table of the sacred bread pictures Christ. He's a sustenance of his people. The altar of incense shows Christ interceding for his people. The ark showed the very presence of God. The golden jar of manna. Christ as the bread of life, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, showing Christ the branch, the chosen who above all others, who alone is life-giving. And the table of the covenant, the law, God's holy standards. <coughs> then in verse 6 through 10, we have something about the work of the priest. Chapter 9. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accompanied, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers, different washings and uh, fleshly ordinances, imposed unto them, <coughs> opposed upon them until the time of reformation. So they would go into the, the priest would go into the uh, tabernacle to trim the lamps, to, the lamps to put in fresh uh, incense on the altar and Replace the bread, and, and uh, verse 7 shows the, in the Holy of Holies, the high priest would go in once a year for the Day of Atonement. Going, first of all, with a bull for his own sins, then entering the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood of the bull on the mercy seat and in front of it. And then you go back out, slaughter one of two goats as a sin offering for the people, take that blood in, then he'd go back out and lay his hands on the other goat, which was alive, confessing the sins of the people, and then that goat, called the scapegoat, would be led out in the wilderness. So it's interesting that verse 7 speaks of this as being a way of forgiveness 
uh, for the errors of the people. Uh, some translations put the sins of the people committed in ignorance. And if you've read uh, a lot in the Old Testament lately, especially in Leviticus, it talks about the sins of ignorance. Um, in Numbers chapter 15, the law stipulated that there was no sacrifice for, the, for sins of willful defiance. Now, we know, of course, there's a real sense in which pretty well all of our sins stem from a defiance of God. But the reference in Numbers seems to be speaking about an outrageous, blasphemous behavior, revolt, treason against God, Numbers 15, 30, and 31. This may parallel what we will get to in Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, where readers are warned against a, an apostasy for which there is no sacrifice. Now we're not going to discuss that now. We'll wait till, wait, wait till chapter 10. But the annual day of atonement would have underscored to Israel a number of vital truths which would serve us well to have them underscored as well. The absolute holiness of God and of how sin separates us from his presence. Uh, that is a missing note in our own lives and certainly in our own culture. And I'm talking about religious culture. I'm not talking about the pagan culture. Uh, but when, when we spend time looking and studying through the, the truth of the tabernacle and then carry it forth to the work of Christ at Calvary, we are confronted head on with the holiness of God and of how our sin separates us from God and that there is nothing that can deal with that other than the blood of Jesus. It shows that sin and defilement reaches all the people, including the high priest. And so that there's none on the earthly level uh, and we, the largest segment of religion in the name of Christ has a man that calls himself, or people call him the Pope. And what do people do when they get into his presence? They bow down, they kiss his hand, all these things. Uh, he may or may not say he is without sin, but there is a level of worship toward him. He's just as... If, if you were a, the highest of high religious people in Christendom, and you were in fact also truly born again, you'd still be equal at the, foot, at the foot of the cross. We're all at the same place. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This, this process here also shows that no one would dare to enter into the presence of God without the sacrifice of an acceptable uh, sacrifice. And of course, Jesus, the whole thing of Hebrews is showing us the superiority of Christ as a sacrifice and that God is well satisfied of him. He is the only mediator. Now, this is totally rejected in the world. And uh, I was talking to a friend this week who has been for a number of years a uh, teacher of a large Sunday school class in a large uh, Baptist church. Uh, down in Georgia. Uh, he's, he's solid in his uh, understanding of the doctrines of grace and the God-centeredness of salvation. And he and I have um, had a lot of good conversation. You would not, if you could see us as roommates at Belmont College and then see us now, <laughs> you'd say, well, God is a God of miracles. <laughs> uh, we won't pursue that, but it's, it's, been a, it's been a great blessing to, to see the work of God's grace and him developing. Well, <clears throat> so when I called him this week, we were just chatting, and he said, oh, 
I need to bring you up to speed. I've left that church. My wife and I have left it. We can't go there anymore. He says, the pastor recently, uh, his daughter is still there. And she came home and said, uh, the pastor is, is hesitant about speaking about the blood of Christ. He openly said this, that he really doesn't like to speak about the blood of Christ because it is so offensive to people. And so even in the religious world, that's, that's where we are. Now some of you uh, may have picked up or heard that the funny man, Steve Harvey, has said that there's no one way to heaven. And here's what he came to. There's no one way to heaven, no one way to paradise. It's like television. Now there's over 800 channels on the cable. They're all pretty entertaining, so I'm pretty sure that to get to heaven, there's got to be more than one route. Because everybody watching another channel or taking another channel than you, they're still getting entertained, and they're probably still getting to heaven. Well, this is no surprise. He's just confessing what a variety of millions say and increasing numbers in the pulpits and the pews believe. That we can get there by our own righteousness. And there, is no, there is no fear of God. There is no concept of God's holiness. And if you start talking about propitiation and, and Jesus becoming our sin bearer, Oh, that's cosmic child abuse. Why is God angry? And no concept of his holiness, no concept of his wrath, and no concept of the need of Jesus bearing our sin. And, and before we get on a high horse about Steve Harvey, let's put this in a very important context. But for the grace of God go I. That's not excusing where he is. Uh, and, uh, but this, this whole uh, unveiling of pages and pages on the tabernacle is sh showing that it is only by proper sacrifice that God is satisfied, uh, his wrath is satisfied, and he can receive us. So, now again, we're, we're looking at something that was Old Covenant. We can look at it through the eyes of New Covenant, and it can, and it can be a great blessing to us to uh, you know, take this uh, visual of the tabernacle and tie it in with the New Testament Scriptures and be freshly amazed at grace, and be led to worship. But again, the Old, the Old Testament system, part of the problem was, there was, and it was a big problem, there was limited access to God. Uh, none of the people, and not even the, the rank and file priest, could ever enter into the Holy of Holies, which was the place where God uniquely met his people. Only the high priest, he could only go there once a year. It also had limited effectiveness. Verse 9, these gifts and sacrifices could not make the worshiper perfect in conscience. So, verse 10, these were external regulations, um, but they did not deal with the conscience. They were temporary, imposed until a time of reformation, that is, the time of Christ. These, these sacrifices, of course, had to be repeated over and over again. Uh, they'd put off the guilt uh, for one year, but it had to be done again. Um, again, it was never intended by God to be perfect or complete. It was all to look forward to Christ. So, in verse 11 through 14... We come to more of the good stuff, we might say. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, 
not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkle the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That is super good news. Uh, so again, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant had limited access. Christ provides complete access. Uh, and Jesus is the only mediator. Uh, I think all of you know me well enough to know that you would, uh, you would not hurt my feelings if you said, I'm glad I don't have to go to God through you. <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad I don't have to go to God through any of you. I mean, it doesn't matter how spirit-filled you are. Um, you have sin. Sometimes you get up on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, you might forget me. You might say, well, do, have we met? Uh, I don't, you know, who are you? Or my plate is full today. I mean, there's so many reasons why... <laughs> We should be exceedingly glad that Jesus is the only mediator between us and God. If by the grace of God you have read the Holy Scriptures and found this profound simplicity and the Holy Spirit has illuminated your mind and heart, uh, in the light of the high treason that we've committed against God and in the light of uh, how much we deserve his wrath and not his mercy, we ought to be given some profound, uh, having some, giving some profound gratitude. Excuse me. Uh, look at verse 11. Some of these translations will say, Christ is now the high priest of good things to come, or of good things that have come. Uh, I personally don't feel a need to debate either one of those because there's truth both ways. Uh, he, is, he is prophetically the high priest of good things to come, but we are living in that era of time when he is the, the high priest of good things that have indeed come. He went to heaven and he didn't take the, these verses tell us he did not take the blood of goats and calves, verse 12, but by his own blood. Other translations say, through his own blood. Again, there's truth however you look at this. However, there are some, and you may or may not have run into this, there are some who, who emphasize by his blood, that Jesus, when he went to heaven, had to, had, had to take literal human blood to heaven with him. And, and that blood is there now. And without that, we don't have redemption. Um, I, don't, I think that's a problem. Um, he did not go there with his blood. He went there through his blood, or by his blood, which he shed at Calvary, everything is completed at Calvary. And, and he, as he intercedes for us there in heaven, uh, everything is based on that which he accomplished at Calvary through his blood, by his blood. But there's no container in heaven that's got blood in it. So if you've never run into that, just forget I said all that. <laughs> so, but if you run into it, just know that with his blood or through his blood, either way you look at that, either way you translate it, it's referring to the once and for all provision and, and uh, completion of redemption that Christ 
accomplished on the cross. He secured our redemption on the cross. So there's, there's no, uh, everything is referred back to what he did at Calvary. And so in your spiritual battles, if you're tempted with a spirit of condemnation, uh, well, that's under the blood of Christ. And I'm not going to, Christ is in heaven and has got a bowl of blood up there. No, uh, Christ went to the cross and shed his blood, gave his life. And God looked upon that, and in his wrath, he was propitiated. Uh, it is finished. Nothing to be added. Now, notice the power of the blood of Christ in verse 13 and 14. Not only complete efficiency to produce the desired result, total forgiveness. And, and again, uh, in your own spiritual battle, and a lot of times in our prayers, and I'm not going to fuss with you, and I may on occasions do this, but I believe that biblically, when I'm praying, and maybe I'm praying a prayer of confession, I don't need to pray and ask God to forgive me in the sense I'm asking him to do something he's not done. Our sins are forgiven once and for all, past, present, and future at Calvary. And we're not trying to be technical here, but we're trying to rejoice in the efficiency and the sufficiency of the blood of Christ. And so it is far better to, in coming in a state of repentance and contrition, to thank him. Lord, I want to thank you that I am forgiven. I want to thank you that you have forgiven us. I want to thank you that that is high motivation for us to get on the right track and go forward. And, 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 and I do confess and I turn from this sin. I'm not asking God to do something he's never done. If I'm asking God to forgive me of sin that he's never forgiven me of, well, again, I, I just don't, I don't see that in Scripture. Confessing, repenting, taking God's point of view is wrong, it's against God, it's got to go, yes. And again, just one I said, I'm not going to, just make sure if you, in the context of that, say, please forgive me of that, I think is very important to continue to say, Lord, I want to thank you that that sin was paid for at Calvary. Make sure that you, that is understood and that that is confessed. One of the, this also will help to break down the barrier. When we sin, one of the things that we get caught up in is trying to earn our way back to God in some fashion. But I can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need because Jesus has already dealt with that situation fully, sufficiency at Calvary. There are a lot of people caught in this uh, trap uh, just uh, and they'll tie in I can't forgive myself but they keep asking God to forgive asking God to forgive and and that turns into me trying to conjure up enough contrition for God to forgive me I need to confess the sin it was wrong it's against God it's got to go it was him uh, no excuses for it but I also need to confess Lord I thank you that sin was paid for at Calvary. Yes. So make sure that's a part of your prayer of repentance and uh, confession and contrition. All of this is involved with not only the power to be forgiven, but the cleansing of our conscience. The blood of bulls and goats uh, might sanctify the flesh on a temporal basis, but these, he says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. So he is the only one who could atone for our sin because he's the only one who was without blemish in all that he did. And so his blood is a substitute for the penalty which we deserve. His blood only can be the substitute because his blood only is sinless blood. Now he says, through the eternal spirit in verse 14. And again, there's debate there as to what is being meant there. And again, I'm in a point of thinking I don't need to uh, divide, take one or the other, but there's truth to be found, for example, in verse 14, through, through the eternal spirit. This can refer to the Holy Spirit. Then it means that Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit when he went to the cross, and this is certainly true. And as the man Christ Jesus, he said, well, my father, I can do nothing. And everything he did was by and through the Holy Spirit. But this can also refer to Jesus' own eternal divine nature and uh, be based on the fact that Jesus' sacrifice was uniquely sufficient because he was not just a man, he's eternal God. So we, this, this phrase can um, strengthen and, or be a reminder for us that he's no mere man on the cross. And, and also, from the other angle, as the man Christ Jesus, he was dependent upon his Father for all things. So, the contrast here, remember, everything in context of this book is showing these Christians the superiority of Jesus. So the difference between the Levitical offerings and Christ's self-offering of himself is infinite in, in uh, its sufficiency and what, doing what the blood of bo go, uh, bulls and goats could ever do. What, a, what an amazing wonder that through Christ's blood we can have a clean conscience. Now, we know, surely we all know that our conscience in and of itself is not a uh, trustworthy or infallible guide because through repeated sin, Titus 1.15, our conscience can be defiled. In 1 Timothy 4.2, our conscience can be seared. Uh, Steve Harvey, and I don't know to what extent, but he was raised, apparently, it is stated, by a godly mother who took him to church. So he, he grew up knowing a lot of the Bible and knowing the gospel, and yet he functions as a human being, apparently with no conscience about a lot of things. Well, that's the nature of sin. How many of you know who Pol Pot is or was in Cambodia? It is said that he murdered between two and seven million Cambodians. And had you been there, some of you uh, would have been on his target list. Everyone who wore eyeglasses murdered. Historians say his evil deeds were greater than those of Hitler and Stalin, if that's possible. But before he died in 1998, he told a reporter that he had a clear conscience. There's no indication he had repented and come to Christ. How could he feel? How could he feel that way? His conscience wasn't clear; it was seared. And you don't have to be a monster like Pol Pot to be in a position where your conscience is seared. How, how, can, how can a person, we talk about a person becoming addicted, addicted to pornography, addicted to responding in anger, addicted, addicted, addicted. Um, that is a process of grieving and quenching the spirit 
a conscious, a process of defiling the conscience, a process of the conscience being seared, doesn't bother you anymore. It should scare the living daylights out of you, out of me. If I can go down some path of sin and it not bother me, the conscience is not sufficient in and of itself, but it is a wonderful gift of God. This thing is wrong. Don't go there. Don't do it. It could be with gluttony. It could be with greed. It could be with anything. And we can get to such a state where it doesn't bother us anymore. So uh, this problem is not reserved for Steve Harvey or Pol Pot. It's something that you and I have to deal with. Our conscience needs to be informed and trained through the Scripture. We learn who God is and what His holy standards are, and our conscience accuses or excuses us. And when our, when our mind and our heart is filled with the Word of God, our conscience is exercised. Remember what Paul said? I exercise myself to have a conscience clear before God and before all men. He, he treated this as a, as a being trained for battle. Uh, just like, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was, uh, my memory is saying that it was when Tiger Woods first came to prominence and was just so excelling in golf. And someone, I'm sure many golfers and many pro athletes who excel have had people come to them, I wish I could be like you. I wish I could play golf like you. He said, no, you don't. I'll go out and hit a thousand balls before I have breakfast. You want to do that? And that's just the beginning of all of his training. We live around people who in their field of work or in their field of sports or whatever, they put themselves through the grind because they want to achieve. Why should we not want to be, why should we be settled or, ha or content to be just so-so, yo-yo, up and down Christians? The Apostle Paul said, I exercise myself. I fought a good fight. That you've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. A part of God's Work in regeneration is to bring his holy law to bear upon our hearts so that we see our sin and we despair of trying to justify ourselves based on our own works. We're guilty. How is our guilt removed? There's only one way, through the sacrifice of an acceptable substitute, uh, Millions of people, including Steve Harvey, are blind and wrong. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The pastor down in Gainesville, Georgia, is dead wrong. There is no minimizing in the Scripture, Old or New Testament, of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And then Romans 3, 24 and 25, being justified as a gift of, by his grace through the redemption, which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Our, our guilt is not removed by penance of trying to earn our way back, totally removed by the blood of Christ. He redeems us. He cleanses us. Uh, and again, God has forgiven me by his grace through his precious blood. I am now free to serve Christ. And that's the point of this passage. I'm not free to go and live like I want to. I'm now free to serve Christ. Uh, the chains have fallen off. I'm now free to serve Christ. So, uh, as we close out, you, some of you, a few of you might have heard of 
a godly pastor of years ago named Charles Simeon. Uh, I bet Lucas has. No? Dickie? Dickie has. Okay. Well, he was over in England years ago. He was an Anglican, a godly Anglican. And uh, uh, someone has recorded uh, his testimony. He was reading and studying about the Lord's Supper. And he says, I met with an expression to this effect, that the Jews knew what they did when they transferred their sin to the head of their offering. The Old Testament Jew who was living by faith. I mean, this was the, I mean, how much more glorious it should be for us. But those who by grace in the Old Covenant, they, they, had, they were transferring through the priests their sins to another. What a glorious reality. The thought came into my mind. What? May I transfer all of my guilt to another? Has God provided an offering for me that I may lay my sins on his head? Then, God willing, I will not bear them on my soul one moment longer. Accordingly, I sought to lay my sins on the sacred head of Jesus. Where are your sins laid? Are your sins laid on Jesus? If not, you're guilty before God and you stand in jeopardy of eternal judgment. Hallelujah, what a Savior. I don't have to bear them anymore. And now I'm free to serve Jesus out of a heart of gratitude. Now I'll have grace to look beyond what somebody has done to me. And I'll see it as an opportunity for me to manifest Christ to them. Because while I was a sinner, without hope, without God, unloving, unresponsive, uncaring, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And when by his grace, the Holy Spirit worked in my heart, and I came to repentance and faith and trusting Jesus, I lay my sins on Jesus and leave them there. So now I'm set free to serve. Now I'm not thinking about what people owe me, but the privilege I have to love Jesus. Now I'm not going to be uh, consumed with the failures of a co-worker, a failure of a family member. Uh, I'm not going to go telling others what so-and-so did to me, and, and therefore I did so-and-so. Anytime you say, or I say, well, so-and-so did so-and-so to me, therefore I did so-and-so. You're millions of light years away from the gospel. The thought came to my mind, may I transfer all my guilt to another? Has God provided an offering for me that I may lay my sins on his head? Then God willing, I will not bear them on my soul one moment longer. Accordingly, I sought to lay my sins on the sacred head of Jesus. Our Father, we bless you and praise you for the wonderful place of Calvary, the wonderful place at the feet of Jesus, our all-sufficient high priest, our entrance into fellowship with Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, seven days a week because of our high priest. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.